I'm going to tell about how one can use mobile phones to study social networks using the tools of network science. So, to give you a bit of background and setting, what is network science and why is it important in general to study networks? Uh, it's important to study networks because networks are truly everywhere. Our cells tick and function because of networks of genetic regulation and protein interactions. Uh, one specific cell type, our nerve cells, are really fond of networking and they form the huge complex network of the human brain. And likewise, our brains like to network. We are never in isolation. We form social networks. We have ties that connect us to others who are then connected to others and finally each of us is a part of a planet-wide social network, unless you happen to be a hermit or something. And then, what, do, what, what does this network do? What do humans do? We like to build even more networks. We build systems like power grids for transferring energy. We build systems for transmitting information, like the internet, that then facilitates further social networking. So, how does one study networks? Basically, once you have the blueprint of a network, then that's just a bunch of numbers. And you can crunch these numbers with the help of a computer and some mathematical tools. Uh, in order to understand network structure, like how are people connected to all the other people, uh, the evolution of networks, the driving processes behind network formation, and also the effects of network structure on dynamical processes that live on top of networks. A good example would be the effects of the global air transportation network on the spreading of infectious diseases like, like the pig flu, for example. So this is network science. Now you know everything about it and we can start moving to mobile phones and social networks. And this is where the touching points to the previous talk come. Nowadays the world is really full of data. Everything we do online is recorded somewhere. Every time you call someone, the mobile operator records whom you called, when did you do that and for how long did you talk for billing purposes. But such huge sets of data are then of course of very big interest to us scientists because we can quantitatively study human behavior on scales that were unheard of before. And this has led to the emergence of so-called computational social science. And so next I'll walk through you through some of my earlier studies related to mobile phones and social networks. So first, let us go back in history, six, seven years. This was the first study that my group did related to mobile telephone calls. What we wanted to do was to investigate the role of weak and strong social ties in networks. And we had access to a beautiful set of data, Complete call records from an European mobile telephone operator with 7 million customers over 18 weeks. Fully anonymized, of course, so we didn't know the identities of the callers, but we knew that person A has called person B for 20 minutes during this time. And from this data, what one can do is construct a network of callers linked by calls. And since we are interested in the strength of social ties, we can use the total duration of calls as a proxy for that, because if we know that certain people talk a lot together, then they have to be at least on fairly good terms, right? So what we set out to do here was to go for a very famous hypothesis from social sciences, Granovetter's weak tie hypothesis which essentially simply in layman, layman's terms tells you that if you are good friends with someone, you are bound to have very many mutual friends. Whereas if you know someone a bit less well, then you don't necessarily share that many friends. And this, this is very commonsensical, and it's a thing that should be, basically should be visible in a big data set such as this. And this is exactly what we find out, what we found out, we, 
provided the first proof of this hypothesis back in 2007 with the big data. So the stronger a social tie, the more common friends people have. It's a bit of like a law of nature regarding human behavior. So if you, if you take enough many people, you see that this effect is clearly there. Uh, this leads to some other consequences. Uh, because of the structure, weak ties are not associated with, with very many shared friends. And that basically tells us that weak ties lead away from our ordinary social circles to, to, a more distant, to more distant parts of the network. And because of this, they are very important for network connectivity and also for getting access to information. If you want to find out something new, you should call someone whom you haven't called in several months because probably you already know the things that your best friends know, right? So to ac get access to new information, call someone who is a bit more distant from you. Okay, but so this, in this study basically the setting was totally static. We sort of assumed that the network doesn't change in time, whereas we know that of course our social circumstances change. New friends come, old friends go, there are changes there. So how do these changes relate to strong and weak ties? And can one find out some regularities, some patterns in such changes? Uh, this is something that we recently studied together with scientists from, scientists from Oxford. And here the setting was as follows, that we have really detailed data on 30 students in a beautiful setting where they are just finishing school and moving away from home to attend university elsewhere. So their social networks are bound to change. This is time of change. And for these students, we had the details of all of their outgoing mobile telephone calls. Who was called and when for 18 months, one and a half years, so a long time, augmented uh, by some survey data. And so what we did with this data was to study the structure of personal networks. Now, my apologies for that because PowerPoint has utterly destroyed this image, but I'll walk you through it anyway. So what we did was we took the students, we counted how many times they call each of their friends or acquaintances, and then we ranked those friends and relatives and acquaintances based on this number of calls and calculated the fraction of calls that goes to each of them. So what percentage of my calls goes to my best friend or family member that I call the most? What fraction goes to the second most called person? By doing that, you get a sort of signature profile of personal networks of, of, of people. Now, because we wanted to investigate the dynamics of such networks, we split this one and a half year time frame into three intervals of six months each and constructed the, the, the signature patterns for each of the students in the data. And this is how the pattern looks like for one of the students for the first six months. What you see here is something that's very typical for humans. However many friends we have or think we have, we mainly communicate with a very small number of others. So most of our communication and most of our interactions are targeted towards just a handful of people. This is how this pattern should be interpreted here. But so what happens to this pattern when this student moves away from home and begins university somewhere else? This is what happens. Now, basically, what we see here is that there's a lot of turnover in his network. These colors here indicate uh, friends that were first seen in the second data interval or third data interval. So many friends of this person get replaced by newcomers. New friends come, old friends have to give away. But, nevertheless, this whole pattern remains roughly uh, the same, roughly similar. So that's a bit surprising because if, if all of my friends change, this means that I still sort of conduct my friendships exactly in the same way as before. And this is exactly what we saw in this data through some careful statistical analysis, that the way people allocate their time to their friends is really persistent to changes in this network structure. 
So I always behave the same regardless of who my friends are. If I normally have two good friends, then that's going to be the case in 10 years from now, but those two friends might be different. So this is a bit of an exaggeration, but this is how the pattern looks like. So very persistent patterns of human behavior. Okay, but so in this picture, uh, we studied the dynamics, changes of personal social networks. And that brings in a time component. So, so there's, there's some timeline there. So what, we've, what if we really zoom in on this timeline? Because from such call records, we know the exact timings of all the calls that these people have made. So it's then of interest to, to have a look at that. What can we learn when we study the exact times of calls? Now, this is from the 7 million people big data set. And this picture depicts the timeline of all the mobile calls made by one person. The green lines are all of his calls or her calls. And the red lines are the same calls but split amongst his friends, to each individual friend. And what do you see basically in this picture? Now, simply, simply by eyeballing the picture, you see that there's a lot of structure there. This doesn't look totally random, right? It looks a bit like barcodes. Uh, it doesn't look very regular either. So there are very clear patterns in the timed call behavior of individuals. And it turns out that there are actually these patterns contain so much information that there's really no possibility to go through this in detail in such a short talk, but I'll simply mention a few of, of these things. So first of all, there is burstiness in calls. What does that mean? What does that mean in layman terms? I mean, okay, it means that people normally don't call their friends like every day or uniformly, randomly. Rather, people's call behavior is such that you typically call someone, say, two, three times in a row in very, very quick succession, then there's a long period of silence. Then again, you make a rapid, rapid burst of calls within a short time frame, and then there's again silence. So this is very sort of inhomogeneous and very uneven pattern of communication. And this appears to be intrinsic to, to how humans communicate via any electronic media. And I would say that it's safe to, safe to say that no one really understands why this is in perfect detail as, as of yet. Okay, then another thing that is visible when we crunch the numbers of such time series of call events is that there are patterns that involve several individuals. There are traces of information flowing on these networks. There are things like chains where A calls B, B immediately calls C, maybe C immediately calls B back. So the actions of people are triggered by the actions of others. And this is something that we have been studying a lot recently with, with several rather interesting findings. And one of them is the fact that when looking at such patterns, it seems that we men are even more simple than, than you might have expected. Because if you take these call chains and patterns, you see that all female patterns show much more diversity and complexity than all male patterns. Typical male behavior would be that A calls B, maybe B calls back, maybe A calls B again. Whereas for women, it's much more like A calls B and C, C calls B, so there's a lot, of, lot, lot more happening there. And one, one could ex exaggerate a bit that this means that we men are sort of, our access to information flowing through such networks is much more limited than, than that of females. But that's a clear thing that is there. Okay, and then actually this whole idea, this whole framework of looking for patterns in time, 
timed patterns in networks leads to something that goes far beyond social network studies. It is of, of very large importance in, in various fields, from life sciences to neuroscience. And this newly emerged framework of temporal networks is perhaps one of the hottest and most active topics in network science right now. And so if, if there are any scientists here in the audience, I'll, I'll advertise a bit, because if they, you have any problem where you have to find time domain patterns in networks, there's a book coming out by, edited by myself and my Swedish colleague just in, in a month or so. Go get it. Okay, then finally to something a bit different. Now, mobile phone data can be used for other purposes than those of fundamental and basic research. Um, actually, the availability of, of inexpensive mobile phones has brought a lot of benefits to the developing world. And even in the poorest countries, uh, there is nowadays a significant number of people who have access to mobile telephones. And in such countries, if you, the data that, that the operators collect can be used to very many good purposes of development, infrastructure planning, humanitarian efforts. For example, if the data comes with positioning information, one can infer movement and travel patterns in a country. And this is important for infrastructure planning, for example, but also in times of crisis, because it allows, for example, for predicting and monitoring the flows of refugees, as happened after the uh, Haiti earthquake, as an, as an example. It's good to know where people go if something bad happens, because then you can target relief efforts to the right places. Or you can do stuff such as find out whether some area in a city is primarily used for residential purposes or whether people work there or what's, what, what's, what's the difference in cases where such information is not at all available because cities have just grown by themselves. So, so this is useful. And now, very recently, my group has taken the first steps along these lines by participating in in a challenge called Data for Development, where Orange uh, released, a mo the mobile telephone operator Orange released data on Ivory Coast in Africa. And from that data, we calculated the baseline mobility and travel patterns in that country that can be used for infrastructure planning, for example, but also in the future for monitoring purposes, because if there are any large scale deviations from these normal patterns, those can be interpreted as the early warning signs of some impeding natural disaster, for example, that gives rise to refugee flows in this country. Okay, to conclude, mobile telephone call records provide data and information that cannot be really obtained by any other means. And they make it possible to study human behavior and networks at the level of entire nations and countries. And in addition to scientific usefulness, such data can also be used for humanitarian and development purposes. And I think I'll finish here. Thank you.